All right. So hallelujah. We're gonna, we are in Revelation 21. We only have one chapter left after this. And then the plan is to go back into the Old Testament where we kind of left off, which was First Chronicles. And, you know, I'm going to ask the Lord to lead and guide me in that. You know, Chronicles is a, it's a series of names, you know, but we're, we'll, we'll try to, to let the Lord lead us to spice it up a little bit. Amen. All right. So we're, you know, let, before we start reading this particular chapter right here, just to give a brief synopsis of where we've recently been. Uh, whenever, you know, when we get to the end of the wrath of God, then we moved into Revelation 19, where we saw the Lord uh, coming back to earth, uh, prepared for battle, uh, where the battle of Armageddon would have taken place. You know, we've covered a lot of ground already, and there were allusions to the battle of Armageddon that it was coming up. One spot, you know, the, um, the Euphrates was dried up to allow the kings of the north, if I'm not mistaken, it might have been in the east, I, I'm shooting from the hip, to come across and prepared for battle. And so then we see in Revelation 19, Jesus is coming back for battle. And, you know, there's other Old Testament passages, too, that describe that the army of God is made up of both believers and angels. And so there was a great battle. You know, we could maybe go back and forth and discuss, you know, well, like, is there really going to be a battle? Is Jesus really going to be riding on a horse and using a literal sword? I just know that it says the sword comes out of his mouth. And I know that there's great power in his word. And I would imagine that he speaks and then a lot of things are happening in that battle is what I would imagine. And so after the battle of Armageddon, whenever we got to to Revelation 20, which was last week, we, we saw where the dragon was uh, placed into the uh, bottomless pit or the abyss. We kind of went back and forth with that a little bit for a thousand years and that Jesus rules and reigns on the earth for a thousand years. You know, these are some of the things that we believe that like this is what the word of God says is going to happen. Amen. And uh, a lot of times people don't spend a lot of time on it. And I don't really know how you feel about what, or how you feel when you hear terminology like this. I know that there's been times in my Christian walk that whenever I read it, I kind of felt like it sounded kind of like sci-fi a little bit. You know, it's like it seems almost unreal. But at the same time, those of us that have had a witness in our heart and have experienced the life of God on the inside of us, we know that there's that he is real and we the word of God bears witness with our spirit. Amen. That that this is going to happen. And so the Bible says that Jesus is going to rule and reign on the earth from the throne of David. It's going to happen. And you know, the Old Testament we talked about that that time. It it talks about almost like a complete reversal where now we see the spirit of Antichrist is driving humanity, driving people, constant temptation, constant temptation towards evil. The world seems to be getting more and more evil as every day goes by. And during that millennial reign, I see there's a flip-flop. And the reason I say that is because of that Isaiah passage that talks about, and we talked about that recently, the wolf and the lamb lying together, the uh, lion eating straw like an oxen. And, you know, and so you see that the spirit has changed during the millennial reign of Christ. And then for a short period of time, Satan will be released from that, from that bottomless pit and allowed to deceive the nations. There's a lot that could probably be said about that, but for sake of time, we'll just mention it in passing. And then now we're seeing the next stage. So after Satan is released for that short period of time to deceive the nations again, then he is cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are located and he's he's never more and so now we see though the concept of a new heaven and a new earth and that's really the main topic of this whole chapter so we're just going to go ahead and go through and we're going to read the chapter and then we'll just point out a few uh, points um, afterwards all right then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth passed away and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them. And they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. 
And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Yeah, you know, I'm just going to take a quick, quick little, yeah, because really you need to just kind of ponder on that for a second. Behold, I am making all things new. Now, I don't know that I'm about to do justice to this because really and truly it, it doesn't need a lot of help from me. But, and people have made different opinions about the passion of the Christ. Some people liked it, some people didn't. Some people felt like it was too Catholic, whatever the case. I don't know if you've ever watched the passion of the Christ. But there's a spot where, yeah, they took some Hollywood liberty, but I'll never forget this particular spot in this, in this movie. Jesus is already beaten. His, his eye is blackened and swollen and closed, and he's carrying a cross, and he ends up going. He's coming down this alleyway in the city before he gets outside of the city, and he's slammed by the soldiers up against a wall. And there's like this one little moment his mom just happened to be, if I'm not mistaken, his mom is just right there. And he looks at her through that swollen eye. He can barely open it, and he says, See, I make all things new. And, dude, it was so powerful to... To see that he's going, he's going to the cross, but in the whole purpose is he's coming to make all things new, you know. And again, I, I don't want to belabor it because I think just by reading it, it, it already touched y'all in your heart. So he said, "Write for these words are faithful and true." Then he said to me, "It is done, Amen. It is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts." From the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death. Now, when we talk about the second death, again, you know, this is that that spot where we were talking about the great white throne judgment, that the first time when we die physically, but you know how I kind of told y'all how the old pastor I used to sit under, I thought that was a good little one-liner. You'll either be born twice or you'll die twice. So you're either born of your mother and born again, or else you will die physically and die spiritually. The second death is talking about what we mentioned last week, which is the great white throne judgment. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me saying, come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God, her brilliance was like a very costly stone as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels and names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east and three gates on the north and three gates on the south and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as the width, and he measured the city with the rod, and 1,500 miles is its length and width and height, and they're equal. Now, I just had a quick question for the for the carpenters in the room because I was just trying to get wrap my head around this. Am I reading this right when it says 1,500 miles? Is it, now, I know in the King James it uses a different word, maybe furlongs, but I've got consulted other commentaries, and most people are in agreement that these furlongs equals out to be this 1,500 miles. So as a carpenter, and I mean, I know I've done some roof calculations, I'm pretty sure to figure out the square miles, I'm supposed to multiply 1,500 by 1,500. And so whenever I do that on my calculator, I come up with 1,500 times 1,500 equals 2,250,000 square miles. Now, I did do a little bit of Googling to try to find out how big is the current earth, and you come across some various, so that might be something y'all want to kind of do later. Maybe maybe you don't really care, but there's a lot of different answers. Some people say that it's, well, like this particular, this one thing here says that it's, 
8,000 square miles. But then there's other ones that say something like 97 million square miles. And so, again, I'm not trying to get too caught up in that, but I am trying to say it's obviously big. And then, you know, and it's, and it's shaped like it's, like it's a cube. Um, so, again, I don't know that I'm getting clear answers to that, but I just wanted to make sure that, that, that we were coming up with that concept. So we're, took, we're talking 2 million or so square miles is this, and this thing. Some people say it's shaped like a pyramid, but that would be kind of weird to me, and I don't even know how you get a pyramid out of this. Really, it's a cube is what it sounds like. But anyway... So it says, with the rod, 1,500 miles is its length, width, height, or equal. And he measured its wall 72 yards according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. I thought that was interesting. That's the first time that ever really stuck out to me before. It's a human measurement, but, it, but it's also being measured according to angelic measurements. And if you noticed earlier, too, not to make too big of a deal, <coughs> but it said that there were angels at each one of the gates, if you noticed that. The material of the wall was jasper. The city was pure gold, like clear glass. I didn't even know gold was like clear glass, but I guess the gold in heaven is like clear glass. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth Chrysoprase, the 11th Jacinth, the 12th Amethyst, and the 12 gates were 12 pearls. That's where the story comes, that the, the pearly gates, right? Each one of the gates was a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. Now, this I thought was interesting. You know, I don't know that I've ever, like, really slowed down and read some of this, but it kind of poses new questions that it's just, it's just to think. I mean, if you're a thinker, right? So it says, the nations will walk by its light. Now, what are we th- what's its light? It's the city. The city's 1,500 miles high, 1,500 miles wide. The, the, the light of the city is God and the Lamb. And this city is casting light. And it's saying, it's like there's a, there, while there's a new heaven and a new earth, it sounds like there's still nations on the new heaven and the new earth. And that some of the people that exist on the new heaven and the new earth are not within the city. That's what it sounds like to me. I mean, I, I'm, again, we don't give, we're not given a whole lot of information about the new heavens and the new earth. We're told a lot about New Jerusalem, but does that not what it says? The nations will walk by its light, meaning that the city, the new Jerusalem, is casting light on the new heavens and the new earth. And the kings of the earth, look at that, will bring their glory into it. So they're obviously traveling to this new Jerusalem in the daytime, for there will be no night there. Its gates will never be closed. It's definitely giving you the image or the picture that this new Jerusalem is here and it's shining and it's casting light on a new heaven and a new on a new earth, if you will, and that there's nations that have leadership that are bringing, what are they bringing? Did they say what they're bringing? The kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. So whatever their, whatever we want to say, glory, their, um, I mean, we'd have to, let's, well, I'll tell you what, let's just go ahead and do that. Let's see what it says. I know what the word glory typically means. It's the same word that's used, honor, praise, dignity. So the idea is, is that if they have any honor or dignity that God has, been, has given to them, they're bringing that right back to God. Amen? Does that make sense? What did you say, sir? Did you make homage? Yeah, there you go. That's a good one. Um, So basically, that's what they would be doing is they would be paying their homage because uh, if they have any dignity, they're giving it back to the king. All right. So in the city has no need of the of the sun or the moon. Okay, we already read that. The nations will walk by its light. They will bring their glory into it in daytime. But I did want to stop here too, real quick. I wanted to bring you to because because I thought that was interesting about the angels. And I never really thought about this before, but look, this is a passage out of Hebrews that talks about New Jerusalem. And this is what it describes. 
Because it's talking about, it, there's a lot of context here. The immediate context is not really where I want to go. I want to just kind of focus on these two verses. But you have come to Mount Zion. He was talking about the old, the old you know, he's talking about current Jerusalem and the presence of God. But then he says, but you, because he's talking to believers, okay. But you have come to Mount Zion, which is another name for it's one of the mountains that is actually in Jerusalem. He says, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Now, I, think, I don't think that it would be improper. As a matter of fact, I think it would be pretty clear from the scripture that when we're talking about New Jerusalem, when we're talking about the heavenly Jerusalem, I personally believe that that's where Jesus is right now. Whenever he told Philip that we talked about over the last couple of, uh, couple of weeks in, in uh, John chapter 14, when he tells Philip, we said it last Sunday, he says, I'm going away. In my father's house are many mansions, King James Version. In my father's house are many dwellings, other translations. And I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And if it was not so, then I would not tell you. And if I go, then I'm coming back for you. And so we know that Jesus says he's coming back. And so I'm, I think that it's clear to me that Jesus is currently working on, however it looks like, this project known as New Jerusalem, all right? And he's got the skills to do it, right, because he was a carpenter on earth. I know they're probably building a whole lot different up there than what we would imagine. But, and I don't even know how it all looks, but you get the point. He's working on it. But look. The living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels. I can just tell you right now, the King James Version says into an innumerable amount of angels. And then he goes on to say, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that this picture that I'm getting of this new Jerusalem has living within its habitation, both believers and angels. That's what seems to be going on. And so it's like a mixture. It's kind of interesting to me because we've been kind of talking on our little off-night Bible study about the celestial creation of God and how there's like this, the way he described it, that there's a a celestial family and then there's a terrestrial or an earthly family and that the two are working in tandem with one another on in the kingdom of God meaning and there's, and we've always known that did we not we've been in the church a long time we've been we've been knowing that angels are part of God's plan and that we've heard stories we heard we heard personal stories in here of angels I've heard stories of missionaries that have been in the field and like they were surrounded by military and then all of a the sudden they like the military takes off running and they hear a story later that yeah well we saw the guards the huge guards that were with you and he's like what are you talking about oh no they were there we saw them and he described these, and it sounds like it was a, these huge angels because they were. So the point is, is that, again, we're not given a lot of information, but I just wanted you to see the idea that it seems like in this uh, new heavenly Jerusalem that there, are, uh, that there are both angels and human beings dwelling together in that city. I mean, and the idea, like, you know, look, we, we know all of the stories of the wedding, uh, the wedding feast, the wedding harvest, the parables, how we describe ourselves as being the bride of Christ according to the, what the Word of God says, and that God the Father is looking for a bride for, the, for His Son. And so while it's calling the city that, I wanted to point that out too, it's calling the city the, as a bride adorned for her husband, really and truly it has to be because of the inhabitants in this city that make the city like the bride, if that makes sense, all right. The city has no need of sun uh, or moon to shine on it. Okay, we already went there. In the daytime, for there will be no night there. Its gates are open. Nothing unclean, no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. All right, so I just wanted to kind of go cover a couple of uh concepts, you know, just to point some things out. So it, it, the main passage of the scripture, one of the things that we already pointed out is about the new heavens and the new earth. Amen. And there's a passage in second Peter that talks about, as a matter of fact, let's just go ahead and go there. Second Peter chapter three, verse 11. And we're going to go ahead and read that real quick. Second Peter three eleven. I like this passage of scripture because, you know, it, it kind of can, can help us 
to uh, understand some things about this life that we're living in. He says, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And so we see that, you know, Peter was talking about the fact that this earth is going to be burned up. You know, and the reason that I think that's important is we go back to the parable of the sower and we hear of how the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches can throw us off track. We get very caught up in the things that are going on in our personal lives, right? And and we can be thrown off track by by the enemy because he's trying to cause bitterness to rise up in our heart frustrations to rise up in our heart and you know Peter reminds us in that text we just read this whole place is burning up you you know what I'm saying I'm not saying don't abide and don't live I'm not saying don't build new houses I'm not saying don't buy new that's not what I'm saying don't be so consumed with the things of the world that you miss the main point that God is trying to say this is a temporary life it's gonna burn up with all the rest of it it's not like King Tut, you can't bring the stuff with you, right? And so what we're supposed to be doing is focusing on the will of God on earth, amen, and what God is desiring to do. And so, and then he says, what manner of life should you be living, seeing that all this other stuff is going to be burning up? And that's, and I think what he's trying to tell people like you and myself that are willing to listen is that, uh, hey, this life is not your own, amen? It was bought with a price. And that you're supposed to live your life for your king, amen, and, and serve him, amen. So it talks about this new Jerusalem and, and that the old has passed away. And he even says in there, it is done. I thought that was interesting. I, tried, I compared the words to see if like the words when he said it is finished was the same word in the Greek as when he says it is done. It's not, it's not the same word, but it's an interesting. It at least gives you a similar concept. You know, Jesus is on the cross and he says it is finished. So the work, uh, the, you know, there's a lot that could, we could say is it, it was finished at that point. One main thing is the power of sin uh, ruling and reigning over mankind, that, that Satan's authority to hold man under the bondage of sin as far as Jesus Jesus' word, it, it was finished. It's not, it's not there anymore. It doesn't have to be there anymore. We can, we can give our heart to the Lord and we can surrender and Jesus has given us victory. But while it's completed, you know, scholars talk about that, meaning in God's mind, the kingdom is already set up. But, but the reality of it is, is that, is that it's, it's here, but it's not yet fulfilled. And, um, but when he says this, it is done. Amen. It's like it's like taking it to a whole nother level. The kingdom of God has has come to its fruition at this point in time. And I do think we're not going to for sake of time. We're not going to go there. But where it says right here, God, it says God tabernacles with man. Let's just go ahead. And I want you to see that real quick. I'm going to go back to Revelation chapter 21. Maybe it was verse three. And it says it right here. It says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, The tabernacle of God is among men. I think that's very powerful. And he will dwell among them. Going back to this, uh, I put a little reference right there. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 33. Going back to the feasts of Leviticus, okay? You remember we've been talking about that quite a bit. And we said that in the first month, uh, in, in the first month, was the, there were four feasts, and we've already talked about it, but let's just remind ourselves what was first, Passover. Passover, Jesus is our Passover lamb. The Passover started, introduced the week of unleavened bread. Jesus is unleavened bread because leaven is yeast, and yeast represents sin. Jesus had no sin. And then the feast of first fruits, we, we've, we've already talked about the fact that Jesus rose from the dead on the feast of first fruits because he was sacrificed. Um, when he was sacrificed in the Sunday is the first day, the first Sunday after the Passover, and that's whenever Jesus rose from the dead. And then Pentecost was 50 days after that. So, so what's interesting to me is that in the first month of the Jewish year, Jesus in his first coming fulfilled all four 
are all four of those feasts were literally fulfilled in Christ at his first coming. Y'all following me? Okay. And so then there was a seventh month. Now, what does the number seventh mean? The number seventh, you could say a lot about the number seven, but it means fulfillment. And it describes completion. Because, again, God created six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. And a Sabbath is a rest day. And the reason why is because the work is completed. Amen? And so in the seventh month, there were three more feasts. So there's a total of seven feasts that the children of Israel were supposed to observe. And in the first time he came, he fulfilled the first four. So there's three, theoretically, that are not completely fulfilled in Christ at this point in time. So many scholars and commentators have questioned, will the last three be fulfilled in his second advent when he comes to complete the work of God on earth, like to make the whole thing completed. Now, what's interesting, if you go back and you read Leviticus 23, and this is just my personal opinion. Some of this I have not seen other people talk about. Some of this many people have talked about. But the first feast that, that signals the seventh month is the Feast of Trumpets. Right? And now we have multiple passages in the Bible that talk about a trumpet being interconnected to the rapture of the church. Do we not? The Thessalonians passage with the, with, the voice, with the sound of the trumpet and the voice of the archangel. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive and remain will go to meet them in the air. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about the blowing of a trumpet and it is interconnected. To the rapture, it's obvious that that's what it's talking about. So we have at least some biblical precedence to talk about that there's definitely a trumpet connected. Can I prove to you that it's the rapture is going to happen on? I'm not even trying to do that. <laughs> I'm just trying to make a point that three feasts have yet to be fulfilled. And the first one beginning in the seventh month is the Feast of Trumpets. The second one takes place 10 days later. And the Jews right now, they still, they still observe it. It's called the 10 days of awe. Okay, so the Feast of Trumpets begins these 10 days because at the end of that 10 days after the feast is something called the Day of Atonement. Right, And with the Day of Atonement, if you'll remember, whenever the temple was erected and they had the Holy of Holies and they had the Ark of the Covenant and they had the mercy seat, what would happen on the Day of Atonement is that the high priest would take the blood of, an, of a sacrifice and he would go beyond the veil and he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat and that, that said that's where God's presence was going to dwell with mankind. That blood turned the mercy seat from a place of judgment to a place of mercy, right? We've already talked about that many times where those two cherubim are looking down and the law on the inside is broken, but their face is peering down on the mercy seat. And so now instead of seeing the broken law, they see the blood of the innocent lamb. That's why you and I are not be, don't have to be judged by God when judgment hits the earth because hopefully we have received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and our sin has been judged on him. But there's coming a day when he's coming to judge the earth. And so what I'm trying to say is if the Feast of Trumpets signals the rapture of the church, and if the Day of Atonement, because these 10 days of awe, is the children of Israel still today preparing themselves and, and, and asking the Lord to search their hearts. And they're still not right because they don't have Jesus, but that's what their ritual is. They're searching their hearts because they know that they don't want to be judged. Okay, So could the Day of Atonement where the literal presence of Jesus is going to show up on the earth, just like the presence dwelt between the cherubim to bring judgment upon the earth. So that's what I'm trying to, that's what I'm trying to say. Feast of Trumpets is the rapture. The Feast of Day of Atonement would be uh, the return for the Battle of Armageddon. And then this right here. I mean, how much more beautiful can it get? God tabernacles with man. Because, see, five days after... The, the Day of Atonement comes the Feast of Tabernacles. Have y'all ever heard of that? If you never heard of it, it's okay. I'm just trying to teach you something today. The Jews for thousands of years have been engaging in these feasts and festivals. You understand it? This is in your Bible. I'm just letting you know this is in your Bible. God commanded them before they left Egypt or before he brought them into the promised land. He said, this is what I want you to do. Every year you're to do this. You're to keep the Passover. You're unleavened bread, uh, you know, first fruits, 
Pentecost, you're to keep these festivals, Feast of Trumpets in the, in the middle part of the year, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. You know what's interesting about the Feast of Tabernacles? They still do it today. You can Google it when you get home. They make themselves little booths, or in the Hebrew, I think the word is Sukkot or something like that. And they'll build like a little, a little booth off of the side of their house, and they got to live. They can't live in their house they got to live in the booth for a, for a week. Actually, the whole feast lasts for eight days. Now, that's an interesting number because, see, there was eight that came through to the other side after the flood, eight people. See, the number eight represents something. If seventh is completion and fulfillment, then eight is the new thing. So it's interesting to me that the Feast of Tabernacles, because eight even in a week starts a new week. And so the Feast of Tabernacles is an eight-day feast where they live in this booth. And it's what it, the whole thing of living in the booth, what would you imagine that was about if you had to take a guess? Somebody want to throw something out there? Throw a little something, something? I believe that's the fulfillment of it. Yes, I believe that is the fulfillment. Was it. But, but what about in the Old Testament? What, what do you think? Because they've been doing it ever since the Old Testament. So what it, it, what it represents is that the children of Israel did not really have a place to lay their head during the Exodus and that they were pilgrims on a journey, but that God took care of them during that time frame. So now this, this is some deep stuff, but it's some good stuff, my friend, because listen, you're a pilgrim on this earth. You, you and I are on a journey. This earth is not your home. This place is not your home, right? Again, I didn't go ahead and build your house, okay? But I'm just trying to make a point. This place is not your home. You're a pilgrim on a journey. This whole thing that we're living on is temporary, is the point that I'm trying to make. And yet there's going to be a day whenever it's no longer going to be a temporary. And that I will tell you one thing, whether you want to buy into the Feast of Trumpets connected to the rapture, whether you want to buy in to the, um, to the Day of Atonement being interconnected to the return for the Battle of Armageddon. I'm going to tell you right now, you will never convince me. I mean, I'm not saying you will never, but you're going to have a hard time convincing me that this terminology right here, behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. I'm telling you right now, I do not question for one second whether or not this is the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. There's no more journey. There's no more unrest. It, God himself will tabernacle. Amen with his people. So I just wanted you to see that. So that goes back to the whole feasts and that completes the feast. But look at that. Look at that next little bullet point right there. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears because he's made all things new and he said it is done. Amen. Isn't that going to be a beautiful beautiful thing, you know? I mean, I don't like I know, hey, look, one thing I appreciate about this church is that, you know, I don't think that we're all trying to just fake it till we make it. We understand that in this world there's heartache and there's pain and there's sorrow, but we do know that the answer is the Lord. And, and I want you to know that he will, he will do more than get us through. He will. If we will learn to truly surrender to him and to quit doing like the children of Israel, listen, we all, if we're not careful, we'll all fall into that trap. Where, Like the children of Israel when we're wandering, we think, we look backwards on Egypt. What is Egypt? Egypt's a type of the world. What is the world? Where you came from, <laughs> right? You're not, you're not, if you're born again tonight, you're not supposed to be part of the world anymore. Now, don't get me wrong. Now, it takes time for the Lord to work that stuff out of us, amen? I want you to be encouraged, and I want you to leave tonight and be like, oh, man, I feel beat down. No, it takes time for the Lord. What, what Robert used to quote it, somebody said it one time, it took, took God one day to get, to get Israel out of Egypt, and it took him 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. Amen? So there's a process of the Lord contending with us to get the world out of us, and many times we longingly look backwards, unfortunately, like Lot's wife. Lord, help us. We're supposed to be looking that way and moving closer to the Lord, and we tend to look backwards towards Egypt, and we remember, like the children of Israel, they remembered the onions and the leeks and the garlics and the melons. Well, what is that supposed to say? The things that, the wor that you think you left behind in the world? What was it? What do you look backwards at? What are you tempted to go back towards, to grab a hold of, that you think that you're missing? That you, that you oh, man, it was, oh, it, I, I need to go back over there because it just felt so good that I need to go backwards to whatever it was. I don't know what it was for you. I mean, I got an idea of what some of those things were for me. But what I've learned is that's a lie. I mean, I, you know. 
I mean, I get it. Onion tastes good in a gumbo, but I'm not going to turn, you know, give up on the Lord for, for onions and, uh, and, or what, nothing else. Amen. But anyway, in the new life, there's no more pain. There's no more sorrow. There's no more tears. He says in verses 6 through 8, the main concept there was it is done. The work is done. These are just three main points that kind of popped out in my head is that he's going to give people water to drink freely. I saw these two different passages of scripture in John chapter 7, verse 38, the Lord. And it was, you know, what's interesting to me, I was doing just a little bit more study last night before I went to bed, is that whenever Jesus says that, whenever he says, uh, you know, he who believes in me out of his better belly will flow rivers of living water, something like that, right? Did I say it kind of wrong? But y'all, y'all remember what I'm talking about. Well, what's interesting is that Jesus is actually at a festival when he says that. And the festival he's at is actually the Feast of Tabernacles. And, and at that feast, for the first seven days, the priests would take waters from the pool of Shalom and they would bring it and they would pour it down the steps of the temple and it would flow down the steps like a river. And so on this last day of the feast, if I remember correctly, Jesus actually says that. And he says that he that believeth in me, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. And so, you know, he also, and then in John 4, verse 10, he tells the Samaritan woman. Y'all remember that story, right? I mean, that's a beautiful story, and I could spend a lot of time on it because I love that story. Because it's, it reminds us that people are empty and hurting in life, and that they're always looking for something to fill the void in their life, and that Jesus is really the answer. And so, if you'll remember, whenever he, they, it's a long, it's kind of like a long story, but it, I don't really want to pull a map up right now, but if, if you could see, uh, I'm going to go ahead and draw. How's that sound? I think I'm going to use the chalkboard. All right, y'all cool with that? All right, so, so here is the, the Sea of Galilee. Here's the Jordan River. Here's the Dead Sea. And then somewhere kind of like this is the land mass. And so this is Israel in between. This is the Mediterranean Sea over here. And so there was an area right here in the middle called Samaria. Okay, so I'm, I'm try, I know I wasn't really planning on really getting into the Samaritan woman too deep, but here I go. And here's Galilee which is around the Sea of Galilee where, you know, Jesus was from. Nazareth is near here. Philip was from there. Peter and his brother were from here. And then down here is the Dead Sea. And, you know, Jerusalem is somewhere kind of like down here. And so John the Baptist and Jesus are baptizing near the Jordan River. And then so you could call this Judah down here because that's the south. And so John the Baptist and Jesus are baptizing down here. And there's like a little bit of a scuffle like, you know, uh, people are, oh man, Jesus is starting to baptize more than John and all this other kind of stuff. And that's when John says, I must decrease so that he might increase. Well, what ends up happening is, is that Jesus uh, decides that he's going he's gonna to exit stage left. He's going to leave this geographical area and he's, he's going to be heading towards Galilee. This is the interesting thing. This area over here on the other side of the Jordan River was known as Perea. Guess what? The Jews hated the Samaritans so much, they would cross over the Jordan, they would walk through the land of Perea. When they bypassed Samaria, they would come back, back across the Jordan. The Bible says that, the, that basically we would say that the Holy Spirit drove Jesus. It says he must needs go through Samaria is what the scripture said. So instead of going around the way most people do, Jesus goes right through the middle of Samaria on his way to Galilee. Now, along the way in Samaria, he meets the Samaritan woman. She's all by herself. She's by the well. And, she, and, and, and listen, there's a whole lot. I mean, I don't mean to break it down too much, but she's drawing water at a time most scholars and commentators don't believe that she would have normally been there. So we're assuming some things, but it makes some sense that it's likely that she's kind of ostracized by her little female community. And we learn why, because Jesus starts to kind of like call some things out. And, 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 he, and he asked her for some water, and she said, what are you doing, a Jew, asking water from me because y'all don't associate with us? Jesus says to her, if you knew who it was that was talking to you, because I can give you living water. And when he says that, it must have stimulated her heart because she said, give me this living water so that I never have to drink again. She's like, I don't really want to come down to this well. I'm tired of being, I'm just assuming this is what she's saying. I'm tired of being by myself. I'm tired of being lonely. I'm tired of 
of all the things that life has done to me. Give me this living water so I don't come down here, have to come down here to draw water anymore. And then he says, what does he say? He says, you want living water? Go get your husband. She said, well, I don't have a husband. He says, this you say is true. You've had five, and the one that you're with now is not your husband. Now, I can tell you that there was a young man that preached that message at the old church. He was the youth pastor, and he said, I just don't believe that's what Jesus was saying. I just don't see Jesus. I'm like, what are, you, what are you talking about? He just said it right there because he just couldn't imagine a world where Jesus would correct someone for the sin in their life. And I'm like, no, Jesus is, don't you understand that Jesus is trying to correct all of us, that we would understand that when we're feeling empty and we're being drawn back towards Egypt and we swear and we think in our mind that it's the leeks and the garlics and the onions and the melons that's going to make us happy, that really what's going to fill our heart is repentance because Acts 2 says that with repentance comes refreshing. And he's like, no, you need to. And so you know what happens is, is that whenever he says that to her, she's like, there's a bunch of other dialogue. She goes back to the city, does she not? And what does she do? She brings half the village with her. <laughs> she tells them, she's like, y'all need to come see this man that done to told me about everything I having to do with my life. She, she turned into a witness. Amen. She turned into a witness, and they came, and they sat there, and they listened to Jesus. And, you know, if you could see his disciples in the midst of it, I don't really want to get into all them, but they're like, you know, who brought you food? You know, yeah, I can't remember. what the, They brought him some food, and when they brought him the food, he said, I got meat to eat thereof or something that you know not of. Well, like, who brought you food? He said, I got, the, my meat is to do my father's will. Yeah, so where, what is he trying to say? The food that nourishes me is to perform the will of my father. And for you and I, there's supposed to be a truth in there for us somewhere. Because, you know, Many times the belly is used to describe the appetite of the flesh, right? And we're just so hungry to fill our belly and to make ourselves feel good. And the Lord's like, well, when are you going to do what I need you to do? Amen. And that's a word for the preacher, starting with the preacher. Amen. He says, he who overcomes will inherit. Now, whenever I saw the word overcome, you know, I wanted to focus on that for a second. Because, look, y'all remember in the very beginning, overcomers. I don't know. What does that mean to you? Like, I, did, I, I just went ahead and remind, wanted to remind y'all about some of the things that we learned about in the first chapters of Revelation. But what does it mean to be an overcomer? I mean, I know that there's a lot that we could probably say, but do you, would you not admit that many, probably maybe many churches in the modern church don't focus on the fact that it's different to be a servant than just to say you love God or that you have to be an overcomer. I mean, what do you think that the true believer, and I'm, I'm really just, this is a rhetorical question because I'm not expecting y'all to answer. I'm just telling you that I was trying to think about some of this myself this afternoon. Whenever, whenever Jesus is saying to be an overcomer, like in your mind, what are some of the things that kind of start dinging and, you know, alarms a little going off? I think for me, a big a big part of it, and, you know, if y'all have something else you're thinking, you, y'all are more than welcome to throw it out there, but it has to do with the way the spirit of Antichrist is hurting the majority of the world and much of the church world has been caught up in it, and that, and that humanity, that broad is the way that leads to destruction and narrow is the path that leads to life, and that the journey of the walk with God is not an easy journey. Like, it, it's rife with sorrow and pain and heartache, but God is going to be there to get us through. And in the end, I believe that that's a big part of being an overcomer is through the grace of God that we, that we were willing to let him work in our hearts and our lives, and we weren't overcome by the devil. Amen? You know, the devil wants to overcome you. You do know that, right? I know y'all know that. I'm just, I'm just saying. He wants to overcome. Yes, sir. Amen. So that's what, like, if you were to get in the land of Israel, you would be overcome. And so the Bible, uh, that's the way people say you become an overcome. Yeah. Okay. You fulfill that. Amen. That yeah. You did it all yeah. Amen. And I'm with you on that. I'm, yeah. Amen. Amen. And I and I agree with that. And I think that that's what I was. Basically, in a way, trying to say, yes, sir. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. 
that I think what he's talking about is initially, in order to be an overcomer, you, you got to give your heart to the Lord, amen, and you got to put your faith in the shed blood of the Lamb, amen, but that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning of the journey, right, and now we got to learn how to keep our faith in the shed blood of the Lamb because of the trials and the tribulations and the things that are going to be thrown our way. But I guess that was my, I was trying to say this something similar when I was saying that the enemy is putting things in our path and he's trying to, he's trying to overcome us and that an overcomer is going to be victorious in Christ. But you left one little part out of that phrase, sir. You, they overcame it by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they did not love their own lives even unto death. So is there something for the believers of all ages? How many believers have lost their life for the cause of Christ, you see? And because, look, the enemy is trying to get people to, to uh, you know, to, to give in is the point. How, how much will we hold on to the Lord? Amen. It's even to the point of if you have to give your life for the gospel. Amen. All right. So, but these are some things, and this is just a quick version, to Ephesus. So you remember these are the seven churches in the book of Revelation in the early chapters. He said, to he that overcomes, this is what he says to Ephesus, you will be able to eat of the tree of life. To Smyrna, he says that if you overcome, you will not be hurt by the second death. Amen. You won't be part of that great white throne judgment. To you that overcome, I will give you to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give you a new name. I don't know what it means, but if Jesus said he's going to give it, amen. I mean, we could sit here and break it down, hidden manna, food from God, you know. But Thyatira, I will give you authority over the nations. Amen. Did you not? And that goes along with the fact that he's building a kingdom and that his people, that goes along with the parable of the talents. And if we've been faithful in this temporary life, he's going to allow us to rule and reign with him, which we talked about last week. Amen. Uh, and to Sardis, he, he said, if you overcome, I will, you will have white garments. And look at this. Boy, this is good. I will confess your name. Before my father and before his angels. Dude, that's like special right there. I'm just saying. Think about that. I mean, that's some powerful stuff. Because like, <laughs> I don't know about you, but there's been times in my life that I know I look like a fool. I mean, just whatever I did, messed, messed things up or whatever. And I can just imagine like my best of friends at that moment in time. Like if I was just like made a, made a buffoon of myself. <laughs> Like, and y'all know what I'm talking about. There's been times in y'all's life that y'all, like, made a major faux pas or you did something goofy, you know, and everybody in the class when you were a kid just busted out laughing at you and they just all started, started dogging you. That's what we used to, we used to call it clowning in Northside Lafayette. And we'll boof you, talk about your mama wearing army boots or something like that and just, like, clowning you and making you look bad. And, and dude, now they call it roasting, right? They've been calling it roasting for a long time, but the kids picked it up. It's not throwing shade. You either throwing shade, that's a small level, but when you're roasting somebody, boy, you're putting the heat on them, and you're making them feel, feel so bad, and it's like whenever somebody's maybe like a little bit nerdy or goofy, or we did something nerdy or goofy, and then everybody's just like putting the heat on us. And wouldn't it be beautiful if you had a friend that was, like, really cool or some dude, the coolest dude in the school, he also had a soft heart or the coolest girl in the school, whoever. And they said, hey, man, leave that dude alone, bro. That's my pod, and I like him. He's cool. He, like, that's my friend, man. Don't be messing with that guy, you see. That's kind of like, I'm, I know it's bigger than that, but I'm just trying to make a point. Jesus said he will confess your name before his father and his father's angels. Amen. He's connecting himself to those that overcome. He's saying, this is my brother right here. I bought this with my blood. And this person overcame through faith in the blood of the lamb. Amen. Their te the testimony, they did not love their own lives even unto death. And they were overcomers and they made it to the end. And I'm going to confess their name in the presence of my father and before his angels. Amen. Listen, Philadelphia, to the church of Philadelphia, he says that if you overcome, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. And to Laodicea, he said, if you overcome, you will sit down with me on my throne. <laughs> Amen. That's a, I don't know what it all means, but I'm telling you right now, it's good stuff. It's a whole lot better than the stuff that we've experienced on this earth, as hard as that may be to believe. Amen. So the verses 9 through 21 was about a place that was prepared. It talked about the lamb's, the lamb's wife. We, we mentioned the fact that um, it was the city. But again, 
the whole of Scripture talks about a bride being married to the groom. And, and we, we know that, that as the church that we are the bride of Christ. And so there's some kind of way that it's connected to this New Jerusalem city. And it's really what's in it. It's the preciousness of the objects that are in it. It talks about the 12 gates and how they're interconnected to the 12 tribes and then the 12 foundations to the 12 apostles. So we see the Old Testament and the New Testament having a, a, a place in here um, interconnected to this new Jerusalem. Amen. One, one people. You know, we, we learned in Ephesians, the apostle Paul told us that, that in Christ, he made two into one. Amen. And so the Old Testament Jerusalem I mean, the Old Testament Israelite, the New Testament Christian, that we, we, we all come the same way through Christ, and we become the people of God. Amen? We talked a little bit about that 1,500 square miles. I don't know how legit it is, but I got a picture whenever I change the page of what one person's depiction is. But I don't know how, how real it is, because I don't know really how big the earth is. If y'all can figure that out and y'all feel confident then I would be interested to see if we could find a true graphic that we could put trust in just to kind of have an idea, you know. But it seems like, you know, when you read behind and you kind of look at it, it almost seems like, like the city, I mean, it says the city's coming out of heaven. From here to Massachusetts. That's a long way. And so that's, and then you're squaring it. Yeah. So there you go. So that, that graphic may be right. Because it. So the, the graphic that I have up here pretty much takes over North America. Yeah. So it sits like. And it's almost like you would imagine. I mean, I'm not trying to get weird on you and talk alien stuff, but it almost sounds like it'd be a spaceship, like an Armageddon that come, <laughs> comes over and it just sits there. You know? I know aliens, if they show up, they're fallen angels. Don't believe them. Don't get on that boat, my friend. All right, so 1,500 square miles, square miles, 12 precious foundation stones for the city wall. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I looked at this a lot in the past. Even like the stones, y'all remember the high priest, and now he had the ephod, and he had the 12 stones on, in the Old Testament. Well, let me just tell you, the, the high priest would wear something called an ephod. He would have his priestly garment, then there was something kind of look, probably look like one of Mike Tyson's old. Y'all remember Mike Tyson back in the day? Y'all don't remember him. He cut a hole in his towel. I, re, I remember because I literally wore that out in public. Cut a hole in the towel and wear it like a shirt. He would wear that over his, but that's what the ephod was like, not a towel. It was a little nicer than that, but it, but it, would, but it would be like a hole that they'd put over. It might have had like some little sashes, but it had three, three rows. I think it was three rows across. It was either three or four. It might have been four. Four rows across and three down, and it had 12 stones, 12 precious stones that were contained in the ephod, and they were representative of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, what's interesting, and I'm not trying to get weirded out on you, but I do, one of the things that we talked about in our last little off-night class was we talked about, what is it, Psalm 19, about God, uh, how, how does, do you remember how it goes, kind of, uh, well, let's just look at it, let's, let's take a look real quick. Psalm 19, 1. The heavens declare his glory. Amen. The heavens, the heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Dude, that's some powerful stuff. So but, now listen, people take this to the point, and I'm, I'm telling you right now, I believe it to be true, and we had a good conversation about it. You know, the way that the earth and the constellations are constantly moving, you know, there's 12 constellations in the sky. And some of them are named, listen, we know that Nimrod tried, is trying to hijack, or Nimrod through Satan tried to hijack the constellations and the stars and the whole concept of astrology. And we understand that people use that for black magic and occultism. And we understand we're not supposed to be reading what people say about our astrological signs and all this kind of stuff like that. But the scripture says that God, God created the heaven and the earth. And he says that the heavens declare his handiwork. So I'm not, so what I'm trying to say is, is that in my opinion, is that it wouldn't surprise me because people have said that the way that these constellations line up at various times through the years, like you can have like actual depictions of the gospel story at various places because there's like a serpent 
kind of some kind of weird serpent thing that can show up, and then you got Virgo and all of this, and it just not it just wouldn't surprise me even in the least little bit that God showed His handiwork in the in the skies. But what I'm trying to tell you is is that you know you got birthstones. I just kind of like Googled that, and some people say that these birthstones are kind of like closely interconnected, and you can read in some commentaries that talk about these Jewish, th that the tribes and the gems that are connected to that are somehow interconnected. I'm, I'm not trying to get you to hang your hat on this. I'm telling you, you do your own research, and if you want to rebuke me later, you can. But what I'm saying is, is that men, there's commentaries out there that talk about that the Jewish people, that these stones were interconnected to the constellations in some way, shape, or form. All right, now we know that the enemy's tried to hijack all that stuff, so we ain't trying to get too deep into that. But I do find that to be interesting, and it wouldn't surprise me even in the least little bit. All right, so 12 gates of pearls and the streets of gold. Amen. If he makes his streets of gold up there in heaven, I believe he can take care of us down here on earth. Amen. So there you go. There's that little scale right there. That's what they say. The New Jerusalem pretty much takes up almost you could say closely all of North America right there. And then that's somebody's depiction of what it would look like coming down out of heaven from the sky. So God and the Lamb are the temple. The Lamb is its lamp, amen, and the nations, we already talked about that, will bring their glory. But, you know, one of the, the things that I want to really close with tonight is has to do with the name being written in the Lamb's book of life, amen. And I know Sean already alluded to that whenever we put in our faith in the blood of Christ and his sacrifice that our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And this is how the chapter ended. And nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying. You know what, though? Let me just, I wanted to point one thing out. I'm sorry. Let's see if I can find it. I can't see. Oh, here it is. I forgot, I wanted to point that out, sorcerers no more. I thought that was interesting to me. So I looked up that word sorcerer. Let me just see if I can find that. Let's see, where was that located? That was in like verses 6 through 8, Salt, Revelation 21, 6. Let's change over to the King James. Verse 8, sorcerers. Listen to what the word means. I thought this, pharmakias, not pharmakia, but pharmakias, from a druggist, where we get the word pharmacist from, or a poisoner, by extension, a magician or sorcerer. Dude, is that crazy? Like, like I'm just wondering in this situation here, like, look, I done told you that the occult reads the Bible. So my point is, is that the occult and the, and the powers that be over the earth, does that, are you trying to say every pharmacist is bad? That's not what I'm trying to say, but I'm pretty sure that Mr. Paul must have ran across this because he, he had a problem with his own profession. And I'm like, well, dude, why you keep practicing? Why you keep dispensing medication? I, and I don't, I don't think that it's just like the dispensing of amoxicillin that's the issue here. I think that the industry, though, has created medications and drugs have been created and that really the original meaning of this word connecting pharmakia to sorcery has to do with specifically drugs that alter the mental status of the mind and that in these ancient times these people would alter their mental status and that they were purposely, I understand that most of us in here that have done drugs before and I'm willing to put myself in the same boat as anybody else that has, weren't doing it so that we could lower the threshold and let demon spirits inhabit our inner being. That's not why we were doing it. That's how they did it back in the day because, like, they would have these women that worked. They were temple prostitutes, okay? I know it's weird, but that's what they did. They were temple prostitutes. Men would pay money to have sex with them in the temple of the false gods, and they would take hallucinogenic drugs and various types of drugs that would lower their inhibitions, and then they would, then they would receive the demonic spirit, and then what would happen is they would become a, they called it a, uh, 
an oracle. They would become an oracle for the, for the false god, and the demon spirit would use them as a vessel to speak forth what they wanted to say. So kind of like Sister Chloe. So, if, I mean, if Sister Chloe was legit, I mean, she's probably just a fraud, but I'm just saying, like a real, it's a soothsayer or a necromancer. That's what they are. They're, that's the study of necromancy, where they cohort with the dead. And so they lower themselves through drugs, through whatever, and they, and they decrease their inhibition, and they allow the demon spirit to fill them, and then they can tell you stuff, because the demon spirits are swirling around, and the demon spirit's been watching you all of your life, and they say, like, oh, tell them about their grandmother, that whatever, da 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 And then they say a word to you, and it's like, oh, nobody else would have known that. This must be of God. Let me go back to Sister Chloe next week and let her read my cards. Let me pay her money and so now they done caught you up in the mess dude and so yeah it was, I'm, yes sir yeah you talking about what god had offered something yes yeah in other words you're saying god's got something else better for us amen praise god i believe that too help us lord <laughs> amen but the point is, is that, again, I'm not trying to say that all pharmacists are bad. I think that this is talking about the industry and the production of drugs and certain medications that alter the chemistry of the mind. And I'm telling you, there's a whole lot more to this that we could sit here and really try to pick apart. But, hey, look, this is in the Bible is the main point that I wanted to make right there. So let's go ahead and let's just close with this last verse of Scripture. Amen. And where it says... Look, only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Aren't you happy tonight that your name's written in the Lamb's book of life? Amen. That you've given your heart to the Lord, that you heard the good news of the gospel, and that you responded by faith. I want to encourage you because, look, I know our church has called, the Lord has called us to be witnesses. I believe that. I believe that that's what God's desire is. He wants to, listen, God wants to do a miracle in your heart. He wants to do a miracle in your heart and in my heart. And when he does that miracle, Guess what he wants? He wants you to be an oracle for him. You hear me now? He wants you to be a mouthpiece for him. Amen. Just as them other people were spewing lies, just like the music industry is spewing lies for the devil, the Lord wants you and I to be a mouthpiece for him. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and praise you. We give you glory and honor, Lord. I pray, Lord God, that anyone that might have watched the video, Lord, or people that are in this house right now, Lord, some of us may still be struggling with some things in our life. Well, we're all, there, there's going to be a new, a new problem that we're going to have to deal with. If it's not today, it'll be tomorrow because the world is fallen. But, Lord, we know that he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. Lord, just like the scripture that Sean used, that they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, they did not love their own lives even unto death. Lord, we look to you and your finished work, Lord, as the source of our victory because we know that when we keep our faith focused on your finished work, that your grace from the Holy Spirit flows into our heart and life, Lord. You change us. You set us free. You deliver us. Lord, we want to give you glory and honor with our lives. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. Fill us with your spirit and use our mouths to tell others the good news of the gospel that they too can partake in the new Jerusalem. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.